to partly talk about what I've been uh, what I've been doing uh, as a postdoc in Uppsala, but then um, then also what my group is doing uh, is doing nowadays. And uh, before I forget, um, I actually need to um, this this kind of work is um, is usually a big team teamwork. So there are a lot of people people that I need to thank. So I want to do that right in the beginning. The photo on top is um, is already during the um, first pandem pandemic summer. Um, that's the most recent uh, lab picture that I that I have of the people that I get to work with every day. Um, and then the picture in the bottom that is um, of a larger um, of a larger consortium to study um, Scandinavian uh, prehistory um, in an interdisciplinary context. So including. Um, geneticists, including archaeolo uh, archaeologists and uh, various subdisciplines there. And of course, um, various funding ag agency agencies um, to pay for, um, well, to pay for uh, data generation, but also to, um, yeah, just for salaries so um, we can pay our rent. Um, so for today, I will be talking about three different, um, th or I will have three different segments. Um, I will be talking about uh, ancient DNA and how um, one can use it or how we used it to um, to learn more about Scandinavian prehistory. Uh, then I have a short segment um, um, on using these kind of te techniques, not just uh, not just on humans. Uh, I would have liked to uh, to show more results on that, but um, well, um, everything seems to be going slower during the pandemic. So um, I'm just that's just a brief intermission. And um, and then at the end, I will uh, will be talking about um, things that we we are doing maybe a bit more about the computational challenges that arise with these um, with working with these kind of data. Uh, but I want to start with uh, kind of my motivation um, for going into this field, and um, it's also kind of how I started, um, like after after doing my PhD and going and going into thinking about what uh, what I want to do as a postdoc. Um, I really like this idea of, um, um, or as an evolution, in general, as an evolution biologist, as an evolutionary geneticist, um, we are interested in inherently temporal processes. Um, but when you're working, um, but when you're working with uh, with genetic data, and especially genetic data from, um, uh, let's say, uh, let's say macroorganisms, let's say um, mammals, and and bigger uh, bigger than that, um, you would usually be restricted to data to uh, from maybe the current generation, maybe one generation back, um, but not uh, not covering an entire entire evolutionary process. I know it's diff it's different. Some of you are working with um, with Drosophila or Arabidopsis, where you can actually do experimental evolution ex experiments, um, but for a lot of other species, you can't do those. So then, um, actually extracting DNA from um, from remains, from bones, and so on, gives us the opportunity to kind of um, observe things as they happen through time. And um, I think a lot of the um, the studies that came out when I did, um, when I was thinking about going into this as a as a postdoc uh, were able to show that um, that sometimes we um, we sequence hundreds and uh, and thousands of modern modern genomes and have very sophisticated analysis methods, um, but we're still missing some signals that just one or two um, um, individuals or genomes uh, from different points in time can just add to the to the picture, um, so we can understand what's happening. Um, in general, this field of um, of doing um, doing ancient DNA is um, um, is a very interdisciplinary field. So, um, in addition to um, to biology or genetics, there. Um, uh, there are different other disciplines coming coming into it, and it was also for me going going into it, that's where I learned a lot. Um, so, for example, you have um, you have archaeology and um, other subdisciplines of, of that um, under uh, to um, to just understand the background of uh, where your samples uh, samples coming are coming from. Um, then there's a long history of uh, what people have been doing with those remains. Um, type of ana analysis before uh, people started doing doing DNA on those, and then if um, think a bit more about the um, the biology perspective, there's still um, there's still various level various levels of where different kinds of experts are getting involved in these kind of projects. So you have uh, the molecular level: how can we um, how can we actually get uh, get DNA out of um, out of remains? 
um, then how do we deal with them computationally and how do we, what kind of uh, population genetics methods um, are we using to, um, to draw conclusions in the end? And um, and I've illustrated that with this uh, with this uh, little cartoon um, down here of the elephant, um, just kind of showing that each of these dis disciplines, um, on their own, would not be able to see the full picture the same way um, as um, as illustrated there. If we speak about the general life cycle of one of those um, ancient DNA projects. Um, then, um, as I said, various different disciplines are involved. It usually starts um, starts with an excavation, finds of human remains, um, which are then um, so individual human remains are then taken to uh, to clean labs where um, where we extract where we extract the DNA. We need to be really careful with contamination, as we uh, as we want to want to avoid um, just sequencing um, the humans that actually handle the bo the bone, as you would add um, high molecular, high quality uh, DNA. Um, so you want to make sure that you actually study um, the, DNA, the DNA of the individual that you want to study in the end. Um, we put those on, um, on sequenc uh, sequencing machi machines, get a lot of output. Um, that output needs to, be, uh, needs to be filtered and analyzed. So um, you need um, high performance computing clusters. And in the end, after um, after all of that, uh, these steps, um, there's usually some kind of uh, colorful picture that um, that people are using to draw conclusions and um, also sometimes happily overinterpret the results in terms of um, of human evolution or of evolution in general and prehistory. Uh, prehistory. What I want to um, more specifically talk uh, talk about now is um, is Scandinavia, um, and Scandinavia is um, the part of Europe that um, that was the last part to be uh, recolonized after the Ice Age. So, uh, so you see here on the um, on the left, you actually see the um, uh, see the uh, see the ice cover um, around the glacial maximum. You see the uh, you see entire Scandinavia is covered by ice. Um, so there were no humans living around that time, whereas in um, or um, there was nothing and not much living there ar ar around that time. And uh, whereas in other parts of Europe, you have uh, you have certain refugia um, where uh, people were able to survive, and um, and then getting more into into the Holocene, so into the last um, 10, 12,000 years, you actually see that there's still um, there's still some ice left um, on the Scandinavian Penin Peninsula. Um, so there's some uh, some glacier in the in the center of the peninsula, but there's so surrounding areas which are um, already um, free to for people to um, to live and to and to migrate. Um, what you see is uh, that the Norwegian coast is actually becoming ice free quite early on. That um, that comes from the Gulf Gulf Stream bringing in um, relatively warm water, um, so that um, that the coast is is already ice free, whereas um, parts of the interior of the peninsula are still covered by ice. So now, if we think about um, ways on how um, humans could actually get into Scandinavia around this time period, then um, uh, well, you come up with a couple with a um, drawing errors on maps, and um, those are a couple of basic uh, basic scenar scenarios. Um, of course, there are um, certain variations to those, uh, but you can kind of colonize Scandinavia from the south, so from um, what is today Germany and um, and Denmark. Um, and then you start colonizing um, the peninsula from the south and go up north uh, around the ice um, and to the to the northern coast of Scandinavia. There's another possibility that you might cross the Baltic, uh, the Baltic Sea. Um, there, are lot, uh, there are some um, some islands there which could which could help on the on that way, and um, and that way you get into what is today Sweden. And then again, you can um, walk around the ice and um, and go north up to the northern coast. Um, the third uh, basic possibility that we um, that we explored was uh, was the possibility of actually going all the way up north, uh, coming from the east, going all the way up north first, and then uh, further south into the uh, the peninsula. So in this case, it would kind of be uh, northern Norway first, and then southern Norway, and then um, what is today Sweden. And uh, so we explored, uh, we kind of thought about those uh, those possible uh, scenarios, basic scenar scenarios. And uh, then we wanted to compare that with uh, with genetic data. 
Um, and for that, we um, we got DNA from a um, from a bunch of um, individuals that lived um, in the last um, or that that are older than seven thousand year, years ago that lived in different parts of um, parts of Scandinavia. Um, we complemented that with um, with different individuals from um, from the literature, different genomes from the literature. So um, in this case, we have pie charts uh, around the map, kind of. Um, showing um, ancestry model modeling with uh, with two different sources one source are uh, um, individuals hunter-gatherer groups that uh, would come from the east and the other source group would be hunter-gatherer groups that come from um, from central and western western europe um, which is displayed here in green and then uh, you see the locations of the different um, different um, scandinavian hunter-gatherers that we sequenced as part of, uh, part of this project and um what you might see here is that actually the individuals that um, are in what is today Norway, um, so in the west of this part, share more or have more of these um, kind of Eastern, so-called Eastern hunter gatherer ancestry in this case. Whereas the individuals that are in Eastern Scandinavia, so um, on the Eastern part of the peninsula and Baltic islands, um, so, so, so modern day Sweden, for example, um, carry more of these green um, ancestry here, these so-called Western hunter-gatherers, which are from um, coming from the South and from Western Europe. So you have this kind of um, contradiction that the um, that the geographic uh, the geographic West is the genetic East and um, and vice versa. So um, you need a bit uh, you need some more complex pattern than just one migration to actually uh, produce these kind of patterns. And um, so what actually works there is that um, is that you if you overlay two of these uh, proposed migrations, um, so one migration first um, coming from the south, coming from modern day Germany, coming from Denmark, um, going into what is Sweden today and then um, and then up the Norwegian coast. And then a, a bit later, a second migration coming from uh, from the east, um, going up to the northern coast first and then down south. Um, and then meeting um, already uh, meeting hunter gatherers that live there already, um, that something like that would create a, a scenario as what we um, as what we have observed and with exactly the um, the kind of gradient of different ancestries as uh, we observe in the um, in the genetic data of these Scandinavian um, hunter gatherers. And it actually turns out that that is something that. Um, or at least this this northern route seem was uh, maybe the most surprising part because people um, I mean it's obviously easier to come from the south where um, where climatic conditions are um, for obvious reasons um, more advantageous so that's something that people have have assumed for a while but there were at least some people in archaeology based on um, based on certain stone tools so this map in the middle here shows uh, radiocarbon dates of uh, certain sites where different types of stone tools were found. So circles and um, and diamonds in this case, um, but there's sample size here is relatively relatively low, and there's always some uncertainty to these uh, to these dates. But you actually see that um, that uh, these like diamond shaped um, um, stone tools arrive in the north in northern Scandinavia before they uh, arrive in southern Scandi Scandinavia. Um, and they seem to come from the east, so that's something that goes um, goes further east into into Eurasia. Um, these type of stone tools uh, that kind of suggests that they may also have been from the archaeological record um, a northern migration, um, and we kind of were able to align that with with a uh, with a genetic da a genetic data in this uh, in this case. Um, which um, I also need to say, as uh, as part of the introduction, was that uh, that I uh, worked with uh, Arabidopsis before. So this pattern of um, Scandinavia being colonized from two directions is um, in no way um, a unique pattern to humans. That's something that you see in um, in various other species as well, including Arabidopsis. Um, so that you have like a southern migration route, you have a northern migration route, and they some somewhere meet uh, in the peninsula and um, in this kind of a hybrid zone. Um, but then we thought, okay, what else can we do with this with this kind of data? Um, one idea was, um, could we use it to try to study local adaptation in some in some way? And um, one obvious candidate for that are pigmentation genes. So um, 
in in humans there's a there's a pretty strong correlation with uh, with skin pigmentation and causal variance and um, and latitude so if you have um if you have these individuals from um very no high up north in in europe um you may have a uh, you may already have the same um, same selection or you have the same selection pressure on these uh, these kind of phenotypes um, and we know from a lot of studies in um, in modern populations what kind of uh, variants are the main variants um, that cause um, different pigmentation ph phenotypes in Europeans. So we could just uh, look at the um, at the occurrence and the allele frequency of those variants in um, in our data. And um, maybe this plot is a bit complicated to um, to explain in like the one minute that I will spend on this slide, but. Um, the idea is that um, since we know that these Scandinavians come from two sources, we have the two source populations. We have the kind of Western group of hunter gatherers, Western European group of hunter gatherers. We have the Eastern European group of hunter gatherers, and we know um, we know at what proportions, at least on a genome-wide average, they mix with each other. And then we can we can um, based on that using the um, using the allele frequencies in the source population, we can kind of um, and the genome-wide um, admixture proportion, we can kind of predict what allele frequencies we would expect in um, in the Scandinavians, in the Scandinavian hunter-gatherers, and that's kind of shown by these blue dots in this in this example. And in all cases, um, in cases the um, the observed allele frequency in um, in the Scandinavians is higher than um, than just what you would just expect um, using linear combination of the sources. Um, the sample size seems to be a bit a bit low to um, to say that um, on a significant um, level for each of the individual markers, um, we did like we did try to calculate um, like a combined p-value that is then uh, below 0 0.05. Um, if you um, yeah, if you if people are aiming for the uh, for that, um, there is a way to um, to do p-hacking here to um, to make that seem significant. Uh, but our main conclusion is you would actually as a um, it's a nice indication, but you would need more data to um, to verify that. Uh, we kind of thought, okay, you could um, you could also go on maybe try to do um, a genome-wide scan. So instead of specifically looking on these, uh, looking at these pigmentation uh, loci, um, do we find some um, genome-wide outliers? And so we performed a scan where we um, tried to look for similarity between the Scandinavian hunter-gatherers and uh, modern Northern Europeans, uh, assuming that um, if there was an adaptation um, 10,000 year, years ago, um, that may have um, may still carry on in modern day modern day populations today. And uh, what you see in this in this plot is that there is basically just um, one locus that stood out in this genome genome scan as a um, really strong um, similarity between um, modern and ancient uh, northern Europeans. Uh, which again, um, you then do uh, in these kind of selection scans, especially in, in humans. Uh, you then do a literature search, you find the gene, and uh, there's always some GWAS that invites you to do some storytelling. Um, so in this case, this gene is involved in uh, or has been found to be significantly associated with performance in um, some exercise and some physical exercise tests. Um, but again, we did um, we did no follow up study uh, studies on that, um, um, and again, it might be it might be worth checking uh, those signals with uh, with bigger sample sizes. Um, but now we can kind of move on in time. So as I said, this was um, this was about the first Scandinavians after the last glacial maximums. We actually as the last glacial maximum actually don't know much what happens what um, did happen before if there was um, any. Um, any human or hominin um, occupation uh, occupation before the before the ice age, there's no clear um, clear evidence on that. Um, so we assume these are kind of the first Scandinavians, and now we move on in time and um, see kind of how ancient DNA can can help us look into later changes. Um, the first step that um, that happened was the introduction of farming practices. So um, people. Um, People then started to change from a hunter-gatherer lifestyle to um, to a lifestyle where people were able to grow their own food, to um, to keep life, uh, livestock, to um, also um, become sedent a sedentary, um, live, live in bigger settlements, group sizes increased, and so on. So that was a 
if we look back at the history of our species, that was a major change um, that was very important and it laid the foundation for a lot of the things that we have today. But there was, um, for a long time, there was the, the question whether that was associated with um, with just an idea spreading or, um, or with new people coming in. Um, and there are other changes later on. So, for example, something specific to, um, to Scandinavia is so-called battle axe culture. So what this picture here shows is, um, is a so-called battle axe, which is um, found as a grave good during um, this time period of people associated with that culture. Um, it's apparently use, useless for, um, for battle, but it's still called that way. Um, again, it's a new type of technology, it's a new type of technology, it's a, it's a type of in innovation. And the question was, again, was that introduced from the outside by people coming in, or was it introduced from the outside by just an idea spreading into Scandinavia? And that, um, um, other study, uh, studies um, by the team here in Uppsala, some of which I was involved in, um, kind of address these later, uh, these later migrations, uh, these later transitions as well. So first, um, people were able to show that in this uh, principal component analysis, you see, um, you see the, the dots um, in the background of some modern European populations. Then this uh, red circle here was the, um, was the first uh, farmer that was sequenced at that point, and these um, these bluish symbols up here are different um, hunter-gatherer groups from Scandinavia. You actually see that they are genetically distinct, um, even though they were all found in, Scan found in Scandinavia. They are clearly genetically different groups. Um, this was um, this was the first study that showed something like that. But um, later studies have um, um, have kind of verified that and made the, made the picture uh, much clearer than that. And um, then two years later, there was another study that I was involved in. We were even, even able to show that um, these two groups, these um, hunter-gatherers um, that lived in Scandinavia and the incoming farmers, um, they were not just two distinct groups, but they also, um, there was gene flow. They, um, it happened exactly this thing that happens when um, when huma humans meet with each other. They um, they produce offspring, and uh, there's some degree of ancestry um, of these hunter gatherer groups uh, that can be found in um, in the different farmers. So again, uh, using the same colors, we see here these this red branch um, of the tree. Those would be uh, would be the um, the early farmers, and you see there's some ancestry coming in from um, from hunter gatherer groups. Um, in blue, um, different levels of, of ancestry. Again, that's a pattern that was refined um, in later studies. And then I also talked about this um, uh, this so-called battle axe culture, which is also probably associated with the introduction of um, of Indo-European languages. So um, languages like um, like English, like Swedish, like German. Uh, so most of the things uh, um, that we speak in Europe these days. Um, and that again, um, we were able to show with um, uh, with genetic data that that was um, that that coincided with the introduction of a new uh, type of ancestry. So, um, in this case, I would like to uh, fo focus your attention on the uh, figure on the right with uh, with these stacked bar plots. So the three different colors here are um, three different ancestries. Blue is the hunter-gatherer ancestry that I talked a lot about in the beginning. Orange is then the ancestry of the early farmers, and green is now a new ancestry coming from um, from the southeast, um, uh, coming from the Pontic Caspian uh, Caspian Steppe, and you see it um, it really replaces a lot of the ancestry in um, in Scandinavia around this time period, around this time period of these um, of these so-called battle axe people. So again, we have a uh, we have a cultural change, we have a um, technological change, we probably have a language change, and again, it's um, it's associated with um, with the introduction of um, of a new ancestry. And actually, at this time, um, so we are now around uh, four to five thousand years ago. And then you have, um, at least in northern Europe, you have um, northern and central Europe. You have most of the ancestries available that you kind of need to um, to mix. A, a modern European. So everything that happens afterwards just kind of shifts those around and creates um, isolation by distance patterns and so on. Um, so yeah, so this is just a map from a um, from another paper kind of showing um, showing this um, final migration that I that I talked about introducing um, these um, this ancestry coming from the Pontic Caspian steppe. So um, 
kind of between the black uh, the black and the and the Caspian Sea uh, north of the um, north of the Caucasus, uh, Caucasus coming into Central Europe and then later into um, into Northern Europe. Okay, and that was um, what I wanted to talk about for um, for humans. Um, now I want to have the do the like quick detour on um, what my group is um, is doing a lot nowadays. Um, and especially since a lot of you are um, um, from the veterinary, veterinary uh, university, university um, I thought this would be quite interesting. I hoped I could show more results, but this is only a very brief part. Um, we are working on sheep. Um, so one of the, um, the early domesticated uh, species, um, which was domesticated in uh, southwestern Asia around uh, 10,000 years ago, plus minus 1,000. Um, so in the same region and same time zone as you also have for um, uh, for cattle, goat, pigs. Um, but in contrast to um, to those species, um, the expansion um, then usually did not meet um, very many wild ancestors and wild relatives uh, throughout uh, or different part of Euro parts of Eurasia, uh, most parts of Europe. Uh, so there was no uh, possibility for interbreeding, which is a completely different story with um, with pigs, where you have wild boars everywhere. Uh, you have different kinds of goats and ibexes um, um, around um, around Eurasia. Um, back then, we also had aurochs in um, in large parts of Eurasia. So it's a different story for different kinds of domesticated species. And then what's also uh, interesting for sheep is that's uh, actually um, a source for different products and not just for meat as um, um as um pigs for example but also for milk and wool so they are these secondary products which um kind of make it interesting from a perspective that there might be uh, might be additional selection going going on on these different traits maybe actually um additional introductions once those um um once kind of um sheep um that produce more wool um or that transition from hair to wool sheep um were, in, um, were invented somewhere that they may have been introduced to other parts of its range later on. So there are a lot of these these things that we could, could study with ancient DNA as well. Um, and I briefly want to talk about a um, one study that uh, we only did a minor part in um, that was mostly done um, by colleagues from um, from Ankara, uh, studying um, very early domesticated sheep from um, from Anatolia. And um, so from around 8,000 ye years ago, um, so relatively close, or maybe even within the original domestication range. And um, what they found um, in, in this paper is that there's a, that you already see at that point, you kind of see uh, like uh, the east-west structure that you see in um, breeds today. So kind of in Asia versus, versus Europe divide in the, in the breeds, um, but that these, uh, ancient sheep were quite different from um, from sheep today. Um, there is a hint in the data that these um, these Anatolian sheep, these Anatolian sheep, and maybe it's important to say that that we're talking about um, uh, not coastal Anatolia but more uh, more central um, Anatolia, that they seem to be um, maybe closer to modern northern European breeds. Um, all of this kind of pointing at um, that um, there might be some additional, um, so there might, in the last 8,000 years, there might be um, quite some complex pattern of additional expansions, migrations kind of shaping the pattern into, um, into what we have today. And that's also, um, that's what we are kind of trying to do, uh, to do in my group nowadays. So um, this map with the different sheep expansions um, is from, um, from a, different, a different paper, but I just like to um, uh, use it for, this, for the purpose of this presentation. So I've in red circled uh, three areas where we actually have ancient, um, ancient samples from and where we ha um, have or are generating um, genomic data. Um, so we kind of instead of um, instead of focusing on what's happening in the um, in the domestication center of sheep, we're kind of uh, taking it taking the expansion of sheep into various directions from um, uh, from at least ends or from extremes of the um, of the distribution at that point. And um, yeah, as I said, I would would have loved to present uh, show more results on that uh, today, um, but uh, maybe that's something for uh, for later this year. And um, with that, I want to come to the final part of a um, final segment of my presentation, and that is challenges in HDNA research. 
And um, so it's a field that um, from the beginning um, had to deal with, um, with quite usual uh, topics, um, contamination and damage. So that was a challenge for getting DNA at all out of the um, samples. Then how can we make sure that, we, um, that we're not sequencing, our, uh, sequencing ourselves? How can we separate contamin contamination from authentic D DNA? And um, just generally, what kind of analysis can we actually do with the limited amount of uh, DNA fragments that we can, authentic DNA fragments that we can get from one of those samples? Um, and that's why, um, why there are certain lab protocol protocols, they're dedicated clean labs to, uh, to deal with that. Um, there are some things that are also need to um, be sure with the, uh, with the downstream analysis because some of the uh, modifications that happen to DNA, DNA over time actually look like uh, C2T changes in the DNA. Um, but there are a lot of other things, for example, uh, fragmentation. So the, short, uh, the fragments are getting shorter and shorter and shorter. So um, there have been new long read sequencing technologies announced, um, which is, I guess, great for a lot of, for a lot of uh, types of research. We ancient DNA researchers can't work with that because um, our fragments are usually shorter than 100 base pairs, so um, already shorter than um, than most reads. Um, but one thing that I um, um, got inter got interested in as a, a technological ch a challenge is um, actually mapping bias, and um, so you need to consider that um, that in all of these resequencing projects, we're actually um, mostly mapping our reads to a single. A linear reference genome, and uh, assuming that we're working with diploid species, then that single linear reference genome is not even a good representation of that particular um, individual that it represents. So, um, at heterozygous sites, you will only show one allele at that point. So, um, if you map those reads to the um, to the reference genome, then um, if you have a if you have a read at the variant site um, carrying the um, the same allele as the reference sequence, um, you will of course have more matches than if you have an alternative allele, um, and that can translate into um, into higher mapping quali qualities, or in the worst case, in um, some reads um, being rejected if they don't care if they're not similar enough to the reference genome, even though that's exactly the position in the reference genome where they would belong to. Um, that's something that is um, that is known to uh, uh, be potentially uh, potentially be an issue, um, especially when it comes to working with structured uh, structure variant calling, uh, but also to some degree estimating heterozygosity because at heterozygous sites you might be missing one of the two alleles. But now with ancient DNA, this um, this problem might actually be much more pronounced. So um, because we are working um, with, as I said, relatively short fragments, we have other postmortem damages to uh, to deal with. Um, sometimes we're also using um, different types of uh, capture approaches. And again, we have um, we have some sequences that uh, that we use to um, to create the baits. So we. Um, kind of might bias ourselves towards the uh, the leads that are present in those baits. Um, there are several techniques to account for these uh, postmortem damages, for example, that um, uh, take the reference allele into into account, which also might introduce some some um, damages. And then um, finally, there's a technique um, due to the low coverage that I think is. Um, um, is uh, is um, used in especially in humans um, in human ancient DNA studies that people only sample um, one random read per position and um, if that read represents one of the two alleles that um, that are known for those variant sites then um, it's just used as a haploid uh, representation of the two individuals uh, of the individual or the two chromosomes at that position. So uh, and some people even use the the major allele for that uh, for that step. So um, again, the potential to uh, bias yourself towards the allele that, um, that is carried in reference um, if um, the non-reference allele maps um, less, less likely or has a lower mapping quality and gets filtered out in, in other steps. Um, and if you think about reference genomes in, in general, so not just, uh, not just for humans, in humans it's actually, um, yeah, so in humans it's a relatively specific case. Uh, because the human reference genome does not represent one single individual. Um, it's more like a mosaic of um, different clones from different uh, uh, from different individuals. 
Um, but then in um, in many other species, you will have a you will have one individual, one strain that the that the reference uh, genome um, originates from. Or you might be working with a species that does not actually have um, its own reference genome, so you may be mapped to uh, map to a species, uh, a map to a reference genome of a different species, um, maybe an out, maybe an outgroup. Um, in certain cases, it might even not be a true outgroup because, um, depending on what you're doing, um, things might not be available. Um, so we kind of investigated that in a bit. Um, um, we just tried to look how much is th is this a problem in ancient DNA, and we actually found in various um, published ancient DNA DNA data sets that um, that this mapping by a bias is present and is detectable. Um, specifically, we saw that um, that the fragment size that I mentioned now a couple of, a couple of times seems to be a major driver of that. Um, so as I said, we usually deal with fragments um, shorter than 100 base pairs. So um, mismatches, um, individual mismatches have affect uh, quite a substantial proportion of those reads. Um, and what we actually found um, in that case is we were able to um, estimate different, different heterozygosities for the exact same individual, depending on what kind of uh, fragment length we looked at. So um, from um, very uh, relatively short fragments between 35 and 40 base, uh, base pairs up to um, longer, longer fragments of around 80 base pairs, we were really seeing significantly different estimates of heterozygosity in that case. Um, which of course should not be biological truth, but is um, pointing very much pointing to a certain bias in um, in the data. Um, something else that, that we checked is that since the human reference genome is actually not um, representing um, just one type, one individual, just one type of ancestry, you can actually separate those ancestries again and then um, do certain types of analyses um, separately and just see what comes out of that. Um, so we calculated the um, the estimated Neanderthal ancestry um, for um, different parts of the reference genome, either the full reference genome, the part of the reference genome that um, can be attributed to European um, ancestry, or the part that can be attributed to um, to African ancestry. And then, um, so what you see on on the left here, those are just different ways of treat uh, treating the uh, the data, which should be more or less affected by this mapping bias. Um, but what you see in this in this table is that you actually, um, in one extreme, we get um, less than one percent of in the African reference as a um, for the same individual as um, Neanderthal ancestry, um, whereas we get up to three point seven percent in the European part of the reference with a different treatment of the with a different treatment with different filtering of the data. So um, this is not to question the presence of. Um, um, of human, um, of, of any archaic ancestry in the, in the human genome. But um, if this um, had been avail available when um, where first studies on that were made, and I know now there are a lot of um, other studies and other signals kind of trying to verify, the, verify this in a more sophisticated way. Um, but just based on, based on the statistic, is, it seems to be um, uh, too much dependent uh, or very dependent um, on the treatment of the of the data and very sensitive to this uh, to this mapping mapping bias. And even if we don't talk about whether uh, whether it's zero or not, and just uh, just the difference between three point seven percent or um, zero point seven percent um, is uh, quite uh, quite a lot, especially when we're talking about the exact same individual again. Um, so yeah, the question at that point um, we were we. We're now able to show that okay, there's there's a difference, um, but it doesn't turn an apple into an orange. So, um, does it really matter? Um, I mean, this is a, this is a field where people just tend to publish in Science and Nature and um, um, and have their big 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 studies, which also make it into the into the general media. So, should they care? And um, there are some considerations there, especially. Um, Nowadays, uh, like uh, like you saw, that I kind of showed almost ten years of um, history of different pub uh, publica uh, publications, and back then, uh, people were publishing uh, single individuals, a handful of individuals per study. Now, um, studies are published with hundreds um, individuals and um, taking together um, 
data from the literature, people analyze thousands of individuals in the same um, in the same paper. So there's a lot of possibility for certain biases or batch effects to drive your results. Uh, people are moving to more and more subtle questions. So it's not like um, are these two groups different from each other, which was the um, the major question in the beginning. It's now can we ex exactly quantify quantify that? Uh, and then the question of whether something is three percent or one percent is actually um, can actually matter. And then people are moving into um, into more um, challenging climates, which um, would uh, affect the preservation of the DNA, um, cause shorter fragments, potentially increase this kind of bias. So um, we definitely need to be aware of these uh, of these kind of issues, um, and we can think about ways uh, how to deal with the, uh, deal with that. So um, potential uh, potential uh, solutions would be um, just to filter the data. Um, to look for different mapping mapping strategies, or um, account for since we can can describe the effect, account for it downstream. Um, and originally, um, we propose we just proposed filters, so um, <clears throat> just exclude reads that, um, for example, exclude reads that would not map to a modified reference genome, a modified reference genome carrying the alternative allele at a certain site, um, and there we were able to show that yeah, that. Um, that reduces uh, reduces the bias. So in this case, um, ideally, you would be at um, at 0.5 on this line, and these different dots uh, showed uh, four different treatments for the same uh, same individual. And um, yeah, the further we go to the right for each in individual, the um, the more filtering we are doing, and you see that some of those get very close to 0.5, but um, but most of them stay below that value. Um, uh, which comes from the com, comes from the fact that the data already went through a mapping step to um, to a linear reference genome, so there is already a bias, and um, and since not always all data or data is pub, uh, published, we cannot um, we cannot go back to the full raw data and um, kind of get those reads back that were excluded in one of the first filtering steps. Um, another thing that was uh, proposed in a um, um, in the paper that came out uh, came out one year later is um, using using variation graphs. So instead of using a linear reference genome as you would do with uh, BWA or Bowtie, um, you can um, map to a graph which um, which actually represents the um, uh, the genetic variation that is present that is known to be present in the species. So in this in this example, um, we have here this would be an insertion um, that we know exists in the species, and you see when you do BWA that some of these lines, which represent single reads, don't actually map to the, uh, map to that, even though this individual would be heterozygous for that. Same way here we have a SNP, so we have an A allele and a C, a C allele, um, and in, um, if you do BWA, you actually see that there are less reads representing the C than representing the A. Um, as A is the allele that is, that, is, um, that is found in the reference genome. Whereas in the bottom, if you use one of these variation, variation graphs, um, so just looking at the SNP, for example, you see about approximately a 50-50 um, proportion um, of the reads mapping to those, uh, to those two different alleles, representing a truly heterozygous individual at that point. And um, when I started talking about this topic uh, like two or three years ago, uh, this um, this was not uh, not very well known, but I um, but I think it's becoming these kind of variation graphs and pan genomics and those kind of topics are becoming more and more um, more and more popular across the fields of genomics uh, to accurately describe um, the uh, the variation that's present at a genome. But again, it's it's a big change also to think about a genome that way instead of uh, like a linear uh, reference genome where we can use coordinates for where our genes are and so on. So at this point, um, we kind of had the two possible um, um, solutions for this kind of uh, mapping bias. Um, would be proposed a filtering, which would um, which would cause again a loss of data because you're kicking things out, and you would be limited to um, to what you have initially. So you might not be able to remove all bias. Um, but then this other paper nicely showed that these variation graphs work well, um, but um, you you kind of need to move. Um, to move to uh, different sets of tools, different um, different data structures, and so on, and also different way of thinking about uh, about the reference genome when working with these uh, variation graphs. 
So, and um, knowing how reluctant, reluctant people can be to move to a new reference genome ver version, um, that's of course a big step to, um, to do, which is um, only happening slowly. But we were thinking, okay, is there anything else that one, one could do? Um, since we know the effect, since we can des describe the effect, can we maybe account for it in, um, in downstream analysis? And that's where the idea was born to, um, to um, adjust genotype likelihoods um, for this mapping bias. So genotype likelihoods are um, um, our way of expressing our uncertainty um, when working um, with lower sequencing, uh, sequencing depth. Um, to not a hard, do hard cause of genotypes, but um, kind of express our uncertainty. So, um, and we could incorporate into into that um, our um, bias, our mapping bias that we know. Um, what we would need is um, um, we cannot call uh, sci variant sites de novo, so we need to ascertain them um, in some way. Um, but we could work with sites mapped to a linear reference uh, reference genome. And um, we would need kind of a per site um, or per individual estimate of, um, of this mapping bias. Um, so uh, that's, what we, uh, that's what we did. We kind of um, did this um, filtering and modified uh, what we did in the filtering um, earlier and modified the reads and the reference genome to see if it still mapped with carrying the other earlier to the same to the exact position and um, just then tested that in, in simulation. So we simulate population demography with, uh, with a certain level of gene flow. Um, we pick, uh, pick a reference individual as a reference uh, sequence and then just map um, all reads to that, um, to that reference genome. And we just pick that reference genome from different populations. And then um, as an example here, um, we then ran different tools for estimating admixture proportions. Um, and this is uh, kind of the result of those uh, of those simulations. So we have um, uh, we have um, without any correction, we have tested five different uh, five different methods. Uh, we are mapping to three different versions of the reference genome. So you see our little demography down here. Um, we have an outgroup, and we have uh, we have an outgroup S one, so that should not have any bias if you map to S one. Um, and we have two sources in our test population T. So we have source S S two and a source S S three. And there's a certain level of um, of admixture coming in. In this case, it's a uh, it's fifty percent. Um, and what you actually see is that most of the methods are very bad at already estimating those fifty percent. It's not just uh, the mapping bias. So there's, there are other issues with the methodology of estimating these um, these ancestry proportions. But you see that for all cases um, cases there is depending on what reference you're mapping uh, mapping to, there is a certain a certain bias um, depending on what method you're using. Um, it can be up to ten or fifteen percent in these um, in these simulations, and usually the um, the mapping to the outgroup would lie in the middle of the, uh, of those results. And then we introduced our um, our um, uh, adjusted uh, genotype likelihoods into um, into these methods into the methods that work with genotype likelihoods. And in that case, we um, so what's in what's called in shown in pink here in these examples are the um, um, other results when um, when mapped to the outgroup, and um, we were in most cases uh, the corrected genotype likelihoods get close to the results that um, you get for the outgroups. But again, we not um, in this case we are not actually getting that close to the true val values because there are other um, other issues with uh, these methods depending on how you filter your data um, and how the exact demography looks like. So this is ongoing going work, and um, as I just said, in most cases, there actually seems to be a stronger difference between between the methods um, than actually the effect of mapping bias. There's one method that is uh, quite popular in the field of especially ancient human DNA called QPADM, which is not actually using genotype likelihood, but which seems to be accurate at um, estimating um, the ancestry proportions, but um, is um, is sensitive to mapping bias to some degree. And due to the uh, um, specificities of that uh, method, it might not be feasible for uh, many non-human species. Um, and something that we're currently looking into, um, um, instead of doing this on a genome-wide level, calculating like a genome-wide average um, of ancestry propor uh, proportion, could we actually do that for single loci? Um, for example, if you're doing a selection scan and um, you certainly don't want um, to find the outlier loci that are just outlier due to um, due to these technical biases, but that's 
Um, we don't have that yet, um, so I cannot talk about that. But OK, I've been talking for quite a while now, and I'm coming to uh, to the end of my presenta presentation. So I hope I've shown you some of these um, um, of the opportunities that uh, come with ancient DNA for um, for studying um, evolution in real time in macro -organ organisms um, with the prehistory of Scandinavia and um, how uh, culture changes is often associated with uh, with temporal uh, with genetic changes. Um, then also some attempts. Um, I know later studies and bigger sample sizes have done and, uh, that as well um, of checking um, the signatures of selection over time and um, also what uh, I hope uh, we will have more uh, results uh, in the near future on tracing the history of domesticated animals. But um, as with um, working with genomic data sets in general, always be aware of your technical uh, artifacts. That's not an ancient DNA specific. Um, issue and uh, we just as a research community as a genomics community we need to uh, make sure that we um, have good approaches for filtering and for mitigating different biases that we are that we're aware of and with that I again want to thank um, the teams that I've been working with that um, that have been doing um, a lot of the, the parts of what I've shown you today um, and I thank you for your attention and for the invitation <laughs>